The tale unfolds as the main character, Ariam, undergoes a sudden and dramatic shift in her life. Struck by the infamous truck gun, she finds herself transported to a fantastical realm known as Soltara. However, this wasn't a typical teleportation that bestowed superpowers upon her. Instead, Ariam becomes entangled in a dark situation, captured by slavers who auction her off as a vampire. Despite the fantastical setting, Ariam doesn't possess any supernatural abilities, and her new reality is far from the typical hero's journey. The auctioneer sets her price at 150,000 gold pieces, labeling her as a vampire in a world where such creatures are feared. Unfortunately, no buyers show interest, considering vampires to be too spooky. Ultimately, she was purchased by the House of Duke and escorted to the palace. Throughout this bewildering journey, Ariam visibly displayed her fear and confusion about the abrupt turn her life has taken. The Duke's representative warns her about the dangerous nature of Duke Millard, emphasizing that he might devour her if displeased. Expecting a ferocious beast, Ariam met Duke Millard, only to find a surprisingly pleasant guy. Curious, he asked her if she was a vampire. In her confusion, she denied it, and that's when Duke Millard's excitement turned into utter disappointment. Turns out, he had unknowingly purchased a vampire from Wish.com, the budget-friendly alternative to mystical creatures. Duke Millard, now realizing he had been scammed, was left utterly speechless. He had spent a small fortune expecting a creature of the night, only to get a lowly with zero vampire perks. Millard had a sudden brainwave and beckoned her over. As she cautiously approached, he seized her hand, and the weirdo in him promptly bit it. To his horror, he realized her blood tasted like piss, and he spat it out. Ariam was left bewildered, wondering why this oddball was gnawing on her. Worry crept in as she thought Millard might just decide to end her life because her blood wasn't up to vampire standards. Meanwhile, Millard scratched his head, confused by what kind of creature Ariam could be. Not quite human, not quite vampire. Contemplating the situation, Millard pondered what to do with this enigmatic blood source. Ariam, realizing her predicament, decided her best shot at survival was to offer her services. She pleaded that she was really good at cleaning and laundry. However, Millard was having none of it, dismissively declaring he didn't need her. Frustrated, Ariam threatened to spill the beans to Duke. After some relentless pleading and negotiating, Duke reluctantly agreed to keep her on as a maid. Ariam, escorted to her room by another maid, found solace in tears, reminiscing about her family. The next morning, she was greeted with a maid uniform, transforming her into the spitting image of a stereotypical maid. Baffled, Ariam wondered why, if this place hated vampires so much, they still served one. Guided to Duke's room, she was tasked with finding the missing piece of a puzzle he was working on. Miraculously, she discovered it under his bed. Now entrusted with a new mission, she had to move some books to the study room. The only hiccup. She had no idea where it was. Returning to Duke's room for guidance, a knife whizzed past her head. Duke, with a dramatic flare, pinned her against the wall, demanding to know who gave her permission to invade his space. Finding herself face to face with the imposing Duke, Ariam felt her cheeks turn into mini Niagara Falls. In a panic, she stammered out an apology, prompting the Duke to summon his right-hand man, Logan. Apparently, Logan was the guy who won her at the auction for the Duke. Logan took on the role of tour guide, leading Ariam through the labyrinthine halls and rooms of the mansion. However, their grand tour was abruptly interrupted by a random maid who whisked Ariam away to the kitchen. There, she was entrusted with the crucial task of delivering a meal to Duke Millard. As they approached Millard's table, ready to perform their culinary mission, Millard decided to change the script. He ordered Ariam to take a seat, surprising her. In the midst of his meal, Ariam, with an air of suspicion, suggested taste testing the food for poison. Millard, seemingly unconcerned about the potential poison, agreed. But, as Ariam sampled the cuisine, Millard's keen vampire eyes spotted a bloodstain on her foot. Logan was being summoned to play escort duty to the medic. In the medical room, Ariam met Marin, who wasted no time asking about her age. Pretty suspicious behavior. As they chatted, Ariam couldn't help but notice Marin's striking resemblance to Harley Quinn from that Joker movie. Post-bandaging, Millard, in a burst of whimsy, tasked Ariam with counting the number of times the word Miller appeared in a book. She dove into the literary challenge, working her butt off and proudly presenting a grand total of 1068. Little did she know, Millard was slightly taken aback by her accuracy, triggering a nostalgic flashback. As a child, someone had locked him in a room with the same counting chore. As the days rolled on, Ariam found herself settling into the routine, though she still approached the food with caution, 
like it held the secret to the universe. She was also becoming well acquainted with Millard's temper, which seemed to revolve around endless chores. One night, while delivering Millard's dinner, Ariam sensed something was off. Concerned, she tried to play the caring nurse, akin to friends desperately trying to carry each other in an unranked LOL game. Millard, however, brushed off her efforts, ordering her to summon someone to the flora. Confused about what the flora was, Ariam sought guidance from the other maids. To her dismay, they not only ignored her but also threw in some good old-fashioned trash talk, fueled by jealousy over her quick bonding with Millard. Undeterred, Ariam approached the head maid and relayed Millard's request. Still puzzled about the flora, she sought clarification from Millard, who remained characteristically unhelpful. Later that night, Millard assigned her the task of reading dates aloud. But Ariam, in a fit of mild rebellion, started complaining. The head maid barged in with important news, leading them to a room where Ariam was instructed to fetch Marin. As they walked, Marin couldn't resist letting out some jealousy-induced complaints. Together, they entered the room where Millard was, and lo and behold, a pink-haired lady, looking more like a femboy, was sitting on the bed. Rose introduced herself and, with a sly wink, inquired if Millard had found a partner for channeling his energy. Rose then dropped a bomb about something called a decree hearing, leaving Ariam utterly confused. Who knew vampire politics could be so confusing? So, it turns out decree was like mortal-immortal marriage with a bonus round. If the mortal spouse manages to off the vampire duke, they hit the jackpot of wealth. Talk about a financial plan with a twist. Ariam, discovering this vampire matrimony hack from Rose, realized that Millard had mistaken her kindness as a ploy for a decree partnership. To clear things up, she bravely ventured into Millard's ominous room. In the shadow of Millard's dark aura, Ariam hesitated before mustering the courage to spill the tea. She clarified that she was there solely to serve him out of goodwill and had no decree ambitions. However, instead of a stern response, Millard, captivated by her lowly-esque explanation, burst into laughter. The furry aficionado Millard then called her closer, patting her on the head like a fluffy kitten. The next day at the office, Ariam decided to flaunt her creativity by crafting a paper crane. Little did she know, this innocent origami attempt would backfire. Millard, eyeing the paper masterpiece, declared that she should mass-produce them. Seeing his newfound interest, Ariam suggested they team up for efficiency. Two cranes are better than one, right? Initially reluctant due to his ego, Millard eventually succumbed to Ariam's persuasive powers. Once he witnessed her crane-folding finesse, there was no turning back. Later that day, Ariam stumbled upon the palace chapel and was in awe of its beauty. The Pope, with his majestic presence, seemed like the epitome of holiness. But alas, the initial charm faded quickly as the sermon turned into a historical reenactment class for Ariam, yawn-inducing, to say the least. The Pope then whipped out some holy concoction in a bucket, producing a glow. Ariam, wide-eyed, couldn't believe her eyes. Summoning the attendees, the Pope invited them for a blessing. When Ariam's turn came, she chatted with him and discovered he was surprisingly friendly, though she couldn't shake the feeling that he was a tad sus. All right, no more Among Us references, promise. The Pope inquired about Ariam's backstory, but she skillfully dodged the question, claiming she had a date with Millard. The Pope, revealing he had the same plans, suggested they go together. Arriving at Millard's room, the Pope proposed the idea of Millard attending that time. However, Millard, acting like a bratty kid, initially declined. Instead, he opted for the more sophisticated activity of folding paper cranes with Ariam. Despite Ariam secretly yearning for the Pope to join, Millard's stubbornness prevailed. Then, out of the blue, Millard changed his mind, deciding to attend. The Pope, thrilled by this unexpected turn of events, asked if he could have a private chat with Ariam. Millard, with the grace of a protective elder sibling, denied the request and shooed the Pope away. Before leaving, the Pope left Ariam with a cryptic message. If she needed anything, she should give him a holler. Ariam, puzzled, sensed the Pope might know more about her than she thought. As they sat down to make paper origamis, Ariam couldn't contain her confusion and questioned why the Pope referred to Millard as an elder. Millard revealed they were blood-related but with a significant age gap, 16 to 17 generations, to be precise. Ariam's shock was palpable. Family reunions must be quite the event in vampire circles. As time ticked away, Ariam found herself settling into the vampire mansion's routine. One fateful night, the head maid rudely interrupted her beauty sleep, instructing her to fetch Millard from his office to the bedroom. Oh, and there might be a dead body involved, she added with a deadpan expression, advising Ariam to act surprised. Now that's a wake-up call. Entering Millard's room, Ariam encountered the scene, Millard, decked out like an overrated anime protagonist, sword in hand, 
and a blood-stained floor. Millard, with the demeanor of Keanu Reeves, questioned her intrusion. Ignoring his inquiry, Ariam suggested a wardrobe change first. As she cleaned him up, Millard, baffled by her lack of fear, questioned her nonchalant attitude. Ariam, in her signature lowly manner, explained that there were times she found him scary and times she didn't. She then smoothly shifted the conversation, asking for the lowdown on the bloodbath. The next day, as Millard lounged in his office, he noticed Ariam acting oddly and couldn't resist asking. Ariam, quick on her feet, claimed she was planning to discuss her hometown with the Pope. Surprisingly, Millard granted her permission. In the chapel, Ariam stood before the Pope, but the real star was Marin, who revealed Ariam's vampiric origins. The Pope decided to play detective. Placing his thumb on Ariam's head, a mysterious light shone upon it. Convinced by the divine glow, the Pope declared her not a vampire. Well, that settles it, vampires or not, it seems like Ariam's got the papal seal of approval. The Pope dropped a bombshell, telling Ariam she was neither human nor vampire, but an empty shell. Curious, the Pope asked her to tell about herself, and Ariam spilled it like a clumsy waiter carrying a tray of drinks. Returning to Millard's office, she told him what happened. In an oddly possessive move, Millard bit his finger and left a bloody mark on her forehead. As if that weren't quirky enough, he handed her a book titled Research on Blood Collection the kind of book that might get you side-eyed at the library. Millard warned her it was a banned and dangerous book. Panicked, Ariam questioned why he'd give her such a thing. Millard claimed it was about vampires and urged her to give it a read. Little did she know, the book was a hot potato, brought to Millard by the assassins who failed miserably at taking him down. As night fell, Logan dropped the news bomb, Count Franager, the banned book enthusiast, committed suicide, blaming Millard in the note. Ariam, now officially part of the vampire drama, tagged along with Millard to the funeral. Franager's son, however, wasn't in the mood for pleasantries, blaming everything on Millard. Our gigachad Millard, unfazed, paid his respects and dipped. On their way back, they swung by a jewelry store, where Millard told Ariam to wait outside. Enter a mysterious lady, eager to know about Millard. Ariam painted him like Picasso with words. Back at the palace, ready for maid duties, the head maid pulled a classic prank. Ariam was sent on an egg-fetching mission and found herself grabbing air. Suddenly, a shadow emerged from the back door, snatched her, leaving behind a lone shoe. After that, Ariam woke up in a wooden cabin, face to face with none other than the femboy-looking man named Urian Miller. Yes, the same Urian family whose name she counted in the Imperial Family Book. Talk about a family reunion in the weirdest way possible. Fearful but trying to keep her cool, Ariam listened as Urian promised to return her home if she answered some questions truthfully. Sensing her anxiety, Urian called in his servant who brought her there, poured hot coffee on his own head in a bizarre apology, and then ordered the poor soul's execution. Just an ordinary day, right? As Urian was about to unleash more chaos, Ariam, in an act of mercy, screamed for him to stop. This maniac's twisted smile and response hinted at an even darker side. Urian then spilled the beans on his real intentions. He wanted Ariam to enter into a decree with Millard. To sweeten the deal, he dangled a hefty price tag for her cooperation. However, even in the midst of the chaos, Ariam could see through Urian's slimy facade. Back in the Duke's office, Millard was playing detective with the head maid, extracting every bit of information about Ariam's connection to the head king. The head maid revealed Ariam's current whereabouts that it was the Taurian cabin. With determination, Millard marched towards the door, ready to reclaim what was his. The head maid, seeing his possessiveness, told him that he also wanted to know what Ariam would choose and if she'd be willing to betray him. Millard, sensing a potential love triangle, demanded the head maid leave. He sat back in his chair, convinced that the dashing Rizzler Urian had nefarious plans to riz Ariam up and snatch her from him. After all, the man was undeniably handsome. Ariam stood her ground against Urian's decree proposal, bluntly telling him she had zero intentions of getting cozy with Millard in any form of matrimonial venture. Urian, surprisingly chill about it, thanked her for the honesty and graciously allowed her to make a swift exit. Taking a carriage straight to the palace, Ariam couldn't help but fret over what the Duke might think of her sudden disappearance. Gathering her courage, she ventured to Millard's room, only to witness him in a state of sheer desperation, bursting out of the door like a bat out of hell. Ariam, overwhelmed, began pouring her heart out about the cabin ordeal, but in a moment of brick-induced impulsivity, Millard planted a kiss on her. The unexpected lip lock left Ariam in a daze, and Millard, seizing the moment, scooped her up and brought her inside. Inside the room, Ariam spilled the beans about the head maid's shady role. 
urging Millard to give her the boot. However, Millard, in a classic boss move, defended the head maid's job performance. Oriam, confused, asked why he didn't come to her rescue at the cabin. Millard left her to connect the dots herself, closing the curtains for some added dramatic flair. Millard embarked on an exposition journey. He told Ariam about the Imperial family's plot to make him mortal through a human-vampire union. The catch? The Imperial family had a murderous vendetta against his potential wives, and he couldn't just find a vampire bride in the realm he ruled. Ariam, wide-eyed, learned the shocking truth. Whoever became Millard's wife would have a target on their back from day one. Now the second prince had decided to play the sugar daddy card with Ariam. Next thing she knew, he sent her a pair of shoes, and not just any shoes. He even took a mold of her feet to ensure a perfect fit. Now, that's commitment. Ariam, intrigued but cautious about Millard's potential reaction, stashed the shoes under her bed for safekeeping. However, when she ventured into Millard's room, ready for the inevitable interrogation, he surprised her by not getting mad at all. Instead, he casually told her to use the gift and any other fabulous products she received. To up the ante in the gift war, Millard whisked Ariam away to an upscale royal shoe shop. There, they encountered a racist shopkeeper who initially refused to serve Ariam in her maid uniform. The lady eventually caved, realizing it wasn't good for business, and showcased their shoe collection. Ariam, with her simple tastes, aimed for practical maid shoes, but Millard had other plans, selecting a flashy pair. Just when Ariam thought the gift saga was over, the second prince struck again, gifting her an apron. This time, Millard didn't reciprocate. Concerned about the escalating gift warfare, Ariam approached Millard, requesting him to call off the prince. Despite his moody demeanor, Millard reluctantly agreed. To smooth things over, Ariam decided to apologize with a touch of flower power. She got Millard some flowers and attached a note filled with sweet sentiments about the value of his gifts. However, instead of receiving gratitude, she got a cold dismissal. Confused by the abrupt reaction, Ariam left the room leaving Millard alone with his newfound flower fragrance obsession. Later that night, as Ariam woke up, she found herself surrounded by a plethora of different flowers, a weird midnight floral surprise courtesy of the eccentric vampire duke. As she rushed out of her room, Ariam found herself accused of breaking a glass vase by an irate maid. Ariam, innocent as a kitten, protested her innocence, but the maid wasn't buying it. With a sigh, Ariam agreed to clean up the mess, just another day in the vampire mansion. Undeterred, she proceeded to Millard's dark and mysterious room, where curtains were shut tight, blocking out any hope of daylight. While pouring hot water for Millard, she mustered the courage to express her gratitude for the gifts, though hinting at the discomfort they brought. Millard, seemingly understanding, promised to ease up on the extravagant gifting. Then came the strange request, the blue teapot. As Ariam scoured the mansion for it, Millard dropped the bomb that it was poisoned. She was then tasked with another errand, this time for a box with a bead, Ariam set out, hoping for a less lethal assignment. In a cinematic flashback, Millard reminisced about creating the blue teapot himself. Why? Because he enjoyed the taste of poison, and being a vampire, it didn't bother him. Just your average vampire with a weird palate. As Ariam scurried to find the bead box, she crossed paths with the mad maid from before, who accused her of snitching to the duke. Ariam, baffled, denied the allegations, but before she could protest further, the maid locked her out in the cold confines of the bathing area. A maid named Isabel helped Ariam out and escorted her to her room. She then informed the duke about it. He was pretty angry hearing that. He then went to the Ariam room to see her. Millard decided to show a softer side when Ariam fell ill, blanketing her in not one, not two, but three layers of warmth. He practically turned her into a human marshmallow. Ariam, feeling like a mummy in a snowstorm, bravely requested the removal of at least one layer. After a heated debate, Millard reluctantly agreed to peel off a blanket, revealing a slightly less bundled Ariam. In a moment of rare seriousness, Millard apologized to Ariam, promising to change his ways. Apparently, he realized he hadn't been the most careful caretaker, and Ariam's condition was proof of that. Just when things seemed to be taking a turn for the wholesome, Pope, the holy light enthusiast, made his entrance, ordered by Millard to fix Ariam. Pope, with all the knowledge of her past life and emptiness, hesitated before applying his holy touch to her forehead. Millard, unimpressed, found the whole blessing affair annoying, and Pope eventually made his exit. Ariam, curious about Millard's displeasure, asked for an explanation, but he brushed her off, sending her off to sleep. Little did she know, Millard was about to unleash a vampire rage fit on the entire servant crew. 
gathering the terrified servants in the hall, Millard, in a fit of rage, singled out the maid responsible for locking Ariam out. In a twisted display of vampire justice, he forced her to drink poison. The poor maid spat blood like an extra in a vampire horror movie. Millard, satisfied with his dramatic execution, left the servants with a stern warning, never touch his maid again. Duke then went to Ariam's room and told her that he would change her room because her current one was too far away. He modified many things about the palace for her. Waking up in her new and improved room, Ariam marveled at the cozy comfort surrounding her. Even the vampire room was conveniently close, as if the entire mansion had undergone a magical makeover. The once jealous and mad maids now bowed to Ariam's newfound authority, creating a strangely harmonious atmosphere. However, the mysterious disappearance of the troublemaking maids, including the one who locked Ariam in the bathing area, left an air of intrigue. Isabel, acting all stern and serious, ushered Ariam to her room, spilling the tea about the fired maids. In a dramatic twist, she pleaded with Ariam to keep Duke Millard in check, as he apparently only listened to her. Isabel spilled the beans about Millard's ruthless act on the head maid's hand, and Ariam, with a sense of responsibility, promised to look into it. After all, someone had to try to stop Millard's rampage, and why not with a dash of body diplomacy? Heading towards Duke Millard's office, Ariam overheard two maids discussing their reluctance to bathe the vampire lord, as he was apparently acting like a monster. Well, vampire problems, right. Inside the office, Millard orchestrated a grand sit-down session, leaving Ariam twiddling her thumbs for what felt like hours. Later that night, Millard called Ariam outside his room and presented her with the D before your imagination runs wild. Let me clarify. It was delicious chocolates. Ariam graciously thanked the Duke, but something seemed off. Millard's face was downcast, leaving Ariam in a state of perplexed chocolatey confusion. He needed Flora as he was hungry. They all freaked out and hastily grabbed another girl instead of Rosa for Flora, the blood-sucking gig. The poor girl they picked was terrified, so Ariam decided to be the peace ambassador and clear up her confusion. But oh boy, the girl was crying like a broken faucet, and it was annoying as heck. Ariam thought of switching from the gentle approach to a slightly threatening one. She told the girl that if she didn't zip it, the duke would turn her into a human juice box. Surprisingly, the girl managed to force a smile through her tears, and Ariam, with a mental eye roll, headed to the duke's lair. On the way, she couldn't shake off the feeling that the new girl was a mini-her when she first landed in this peculiar palace. When she finally reached the Duke's office, she revealed about the new recruit for Flora. Now, Duke, in all his blood-sucking glory, sauntered over to check out the new girl. However, he couldn't quite read Ariam's expression. Confusion struck him like a lightning bolt, and he got all anxious, feeling like he messed something up. Little did he know, Ariam was just pondering about life and reminiscing her first days in the blood-sucking paradise. As Duke approached the sobbing girl, something snapped inside him, and he ended up squeezing her neck a bit too hard. Oops. Realization hit him like a ton of bricks, and he stepped back, regret washing over his vampire conscience. Seeking redemption, he asked the girl about human-like gestures to do something nice for Ariam. The girl, still sniffling, suggested a raise or some cold, hard cash. As she rambled on, Duke's super-sensitive vampire nose caught a whiff of blood. Outside the room, Ariam's patience was wearing thin. She envisioned the worst and, fueled by memories of her own entry into this bizarre palace, pulled out a dagger, giving her finger a little paper cut for dramatic effect. Just as she was ready to superhero her way into the room, Duke intercepted her. He realized she thought he was turning the girl into a snack, and his delicate, femboy ego took a hit. Ariam assured him it was just a deja vu moment, and the duke, looking slightly wounded, retreated into his lair. That night, like a mysterious nocturnal creature, he vanished into the forest without a word. Probably to contemplate his vampiric existence or maybe just to have a dramatic brooding session under the moonlight. Who knows? Vampires, right. Well, you see, Millard, the Duke of Brooding, wasn't really a sissy femboy, but more like a lonely vampire with a serious case of the blues. His childhood was basically a vampire version of being grounded forever. He spent his early days locked up in a room with nothing but a book for company. The dude practically had a PhD in self-taught reading. Fast forward to adulthood, and Millard became a big shot duke. But alas, loneliness was still his trusty sidekick. Then one day, Logan spilled the beans about a vampire girl up for grabs at an auction. Millard's eyes probably sparkled with excitement at the prospect of having a fang buddy to share his woes. But when he snagged the girl, it turned out she was as human as a pizza delivery guy. Now, most people would have gone for the dramatic throat-ripping move, but not our Millard. Nope, he decided to keep her around to make her suffer, because why not? However, as they shared a living space, 
her personality started doing a little dance on his lonely heartstrings. She turned out to be a real character, a breath of fresh air in Millard's eternal gloom. Her antics went from annoying to amusing, and against all vampire odds, she brought a smidge of happiness to Millard's undead existence. The next day, Ariam strolled into her room, expecting to find Millard, but he was nowhere in sight. A whole week went by, and still, no sign of the elusive duke. Ariam couldn't help but notice that the other servants were just carrying on with their chores as if the duke's disappearance was just a blip on their radar. Puzzled, she lounged on her bed, wondering where on earth the duke had vanished to and what kind of shenanigans he was up to. Just as her thoughts were spiraling into a worry-fueled daydream, there was a knock on her door. Lo and behold, it was the duke himself. Before Ariam could even process his presence, he gave her head. Ah, got you dirty dirty, not that type of head. He presented her with the severed head of the slave trader who had captured her. Duke then told her that he had single-handedly cleared out the entire slave trader market and liberated Ariam. Instead of jumping for joy, Ariam was still processing the information. But Duke misread her expression, thinking she was disappointed. Duke transformed into a full-blown simp, desperately asking her how he could make her happy. In a fit of anxiety, Duke broke down, even going as far as kneeling in front of her, begging for forgiveness. Ariam, surprised by the dramatics, picked him up, but Duke continued to plead, convinced she saw him as a monster. As a peace offering, he handed her a recommendation letter, maybe thinking she wanted to escape the madness. Ariam, however, dismissed the idea, deciding she wanted to stick around. The next morning, Millard dove had first into a mountain of letters like a paper-hungry detective on a mission. Ariam, his trusty psychic in the noble art of dustbin duty, stood by his side. As Millard sifted through the stack, he spotted the prestigious Eck Miller invitation letter, gave it a casual nod, and expertly tossed it into the not-interested pile. Ariam, now promoted from garbage lady to chief name cutter, took on her new role with a determined flourish. Enter Logan, the bearer of news and the harbinger of concerns. Pope also made a grand entrance, fretting over Millard's apparent rejection of an invite from Emperor Eckmiller. Shocked and slightly offended by Millard's nonchalance just two weeks before the grand ceremony, Pope pleaded with him to at least attend the medal awarding part. Millard suggested FedEx delivery to the Emperor for the medal. Pope, in disbelief, informed Millard that the Emperor was so impressed by his slave trader eliminating prowess that he was offering the second highest medal. Ariam, however, convinced Millard to seize the opportunity. Later that night, a grateful Ariam thanked Millard for liberating the slaves, sharing that it reminded her of her own captivity. Millard suddenly connected the dots. He realized that when Ariam spoke of her initial day in that world, she meant the day she got caught by slavers. In a moment of delusional glory, Millard asked Ariam if she wanted to go back home. Ariam, with a dose of reality, explained that going back wasn't in the cards for her. Millard breathed a sigh of relief, interpreting her words as a sign of affection. Oh, the wonders of his deluded mind. With grand plans forming, Millard decided to turn their current location into a new home for Ariam. Because why settle for saving the day when you can also redecorate the entire plot? The next morning, Duke sat in his office, looking like a corporate slave burning the midnight oil. Ariam, stationed comfortably on a couch, couldn't help but notice his pale demeanor. Being the inquisitive soul he was, he decided to dive into the mysteries of Ariam's past life. Asking about her academic endeavors, Ariam revealed she was once a shining academic star with dreams of becoming a civil servant. Millard, looking like he just discovered a parallel universe, was shocked at her studious past and immediately began comparing her to the students in his world. In a flash of inspiration, or perhaps desperation, he summoned Julio Almas, the librarian advisor, to be Ariam's academic mentor. Introductions were made, and Julio handed Ariam a question paper that even our translator found confusing. The studying journey began in the afternoon, and Ariam couldn't help but feel a bit out of her element. Meanwhile, at the maid mess, the head maid burst in with a grand announcement. A function was on the horizon and all servants could pen down their requests for wages or bonuses. Cheers erupted from the staff, but Ariam, in a rare moment of worry, realized she couldn't navigate the festivities alone. Off to Isabel, she went, requesting her company for the upcoming shenanigans. A visit to Duke's office ensued, but Millard was deep in a bad mood. Ariam, blissfully unaware of the storm brewing in his corporate slave heart, shared her festival plans with Isabel, only to unintentionally exacerbate Millard's already grumpy state. The next day, with all servant requests completed, Millard made a dramatic exit from the palace. A curious servant asked Ariam why she wasn't joining him for the parade. Baffled but eager for adventure, she decided to ditch the office and hit the festival with Isabel. 
At the lively festival, Ariam decided to go incognito, sporting a hat to keep her black locks and identity under wraps. The whole event was a chaotic whirlwind of excitement. Ariam and Isabel, attempting to catch a glimpse of the parade, found themselves sandwiched in the crowd like a piece of meat between teeth. Ariam's anxiety levels were reaching new heights, and Isabel, not exactly a beacon of empathy, was yelling at her to toughen up. Meanwhile, over at the Emperor's palace, Duke Eckmiller encountered the formidable presence of Duke. However, Duke's mood wasn't exactly festive as he brooded over the idea of Ariam enjoying herself without him. Logan, ever the voice of reason, advised Duke against making a scene. Duke, caught in the whirlwind of thoughts about a mere maid, found himself in a tangle of emotions. Enter the femboy prince, ready to apologize but equally ready to stir the pot. Inquiring about Ariam, Duke grumpily asserted that the prince had no business knowing about her. The prince, with a mischievous grin, tried his best to annoy Duke, who, in a state of confusion, turned on his heel and walked away. The prince, observing this, realized his plan to pique Duke's interest in Ariam was working like a charm. Back at the function, as the parade finally kicked off, Duke found himself holding a leash with the head maid on the other end, the center of attention for the parade. The head maid took the spotlight during the parade, the crowd erupted in cheers, leaving Duke in the dust like my crush neglects me. The parade itself was a dazzling spectacle, and the entire audience soaked up the enjoyment. Once the glitter settled, everyone returned to their usual festival shenanigans. On the way back, Ariam couldn't help but inquire about the head maid's strange position with Duke. Isabel spilled the beans, revealing that she was initially Duke's chosen companion because, well, there wasn't anyone else around. Isabel clarified that sitting on a horse with a woman beside you symbolized obedience, and she dropped the bomb that she was Duke's initial pick. They took a breather at a fried chicken stall, where Isabel casually suggested Ariam could be the priestess in the parade. Ariam, not feeling the whole horseback obedience vibe, questioned the term priestess. Isabel, in her typical straightforward style, recounted a scandalous tale of a viscount who accidentally brought his side piece instead of his fiancée to the parade. The woman on the horse became the equivalent of Saul if young and a priestess if old. Ariam had missed the chance to be the youthful Saul equivalent. Opportunity knocked, but she didn't answer. Isabel then revealed that she was paid to be friendly to Ariam and advised her to sing her praises in front of the duke. They wrapped up the function with more enjoyment and headed back to the palace. Nillard, returning and still fuming over his encounter with the prince, fretted about whether Ariam cared about the medal he received. In a surprise twist, he decided to check on her in her room, only to be greeted by Ariam like it was his birthday. Surprise. The grumpy old grandpa, Duke, didn't seem impressed at all with Ariam's excitement. He brushed off her enthusiasm, telling her not to force herself into these things. Ariam, determined to make her point, retorted that she wasn't forcing herself, she genuinely wanted to do it. Sensing his displeasure, she quickly apologized and suggested she should leave. Just as she was about to make her exit, Duke halted her with a gruff voice, instructing her to light the candles and share the tales of her day. Reluctantly, they both settled down, and Ariam revealed every detail. As she narrated, Duke, in his own gruff way, asked if she had fun. She beamed and replied, it was awesome. Tons of fun. Suddenly, Duke sprang from his chair and fetched a sky lantern from another room. He suggested they send it together. They ascended to the terrace, lit it up, and watched it float into the night sky. Ariam couldn't help but feel genuinely happy, and it dawned on Millard that, grumpy as he may be, he had managed to bring joy to her day. The next day, Duke surprised Ariam with an invitation to the Emperor's birthday. However, apprehension set in as she worried about judgment at this royal event. Duke reassured her, but Ariam still feared potential humiliation. Eventually, she agreed, only to realize the celebration was in three months, not enough time to master dance and etiquette. During a study session with her advisor, Ariam told him about Duke's invitation. Desperate for guidance, she pressed the advisor, who bluntly admitted he couldn't do much. Undeterred, she insisted, and he reluctantly agreed to look into it. After their study session, the advisor spilled all the beans to Duke, who, in his typical grumpy fashion, declared that Ariam thinks way too much. The advisor, trying to be helpful, suggested bringing in Elsa for etiquette lessons, but that idea didn't sit well with Duke, who promptly told him to stay in his lane. The advisor, sensing the gravity of the situation, knelt and apologized, prompting Duke to warn him about the watchful eyes and the need to be more careful. Ariam's next study session started a tad early, with a mission to prepare for the upcoming birthday bash. After completing a chapter, the advisor instructed Ariam to head to a room on the second floor, East Wing. 
as she explored. A lady named Evangeline and a nerdy-looking boy, Doran, introduced themselves. Apparently, Evangeline was there to teach Ariam the palace waltz. They kicked things off with some knee-bending action and a bit of dancing. Once Evangeline left, another lady stepped in, ready to school Ariam in palace etiquette. Come nighttime, Ariam's back felt like she'd been in a gaming marathon with a 20-something gamer. Tired and aching, she realized Duke wasn't a furry treating her like a pet. The next day, during the study session, the advisor lost his cool with Ariam, convinced she'd ruined Duke's reputation at the birthday party. Word got back to Duke, who summoned the advisor to his office. There, the grumpy Duke unleashed his rage, threatening the advisor for scolding Ariam. The advisor, desperate to save face, pleaded that everything was for Duke's reputation. Unmoved, Duke sentenced the advisor to the dungeon, where he would await his punishment. As Ariam waltzed into the study session, expecting her usual advisor, she discovered an empty chair instead. Puzzled, she headed to Duke's office to seek answers. Duke, with a guilty look, apologized on behalf of the missing advisor, admitting that he had been a bit too stern with her. However, Ariam shrugged it off, claiming she could handle a verbal slap or two since it was all out of concern. While they chatted, Pope made a grand entrance, and Duke's expression instantly plummeted. He promptly instructed Ariam to play hostess and entertain Pope in the hall. As she approached Pope with the head maid, the head maid, surprisingly all sugar and spice, expressed her delight at Ariam getting cozy with Duke, believing it was softening him up. Ariam, caught off guard by the sudden friendliness, just nodded along. Pope, on the other hand, unleashed his inner bargain bin counselor on Ariam, asking about her feelings in the palace. Dropping the bomb that he too suffered under the missing advisor, Pope attempted some budget therapy. Before the conversation got too absurd, Duke swooped in and sent Ariam off to rest. Ignoring Duke's advice, Ariam sneakily headed to his office and stumbled upon a smuggling case report. Caught up in reading, she lost track of time. Suddenly, it hit her, it was Walt's training time with Evangeline. Rushing to the session, she found herself learning a myriad of hand signals and even got a crash course on how to be intentionally rude. As the night dragged on, Ariam, still wide awake, practiced her walking technique in her room. Duke happened to stroll by and spotted her, a grin spreading across his face. Maybe the sight of her perfecting her walk was the unexpected highlight of his day. The next day, Duke decided to take Ariam to a jewelry shop to flex his diamond knowledge. He showed her a bunch of sparkly rocks and asked her to spot the difference. But, surprise, Ariam couldn't play the spot the diamond game. While Duke disappeared into the back room with the owner, the shop lady popped up like a jack-in-the-box to greet Ariam. Ariam, confused about the diamond dilemma, asked the shop lady why all the rocks looked like long-lost twins. Turns out, some sneaky distributor stole their diamond grinding saw and sold it to the competition. The shop lady was stressing about the rival shop making copycat diamonds faster than a microwave popcorn bag pops. In the middle of this diamond drama, Duke strolled back in, and he and Ariam made a hasty exit. Outside, Duke, the high and mighty, surprisingly helped Ariam onto the carriage. Ariam raised an eyebrow, thinking it's not every day you see a Duke doubling as a personal chauffeur. But wait, Duke had an excuse ready. He claimed Ariam was as fragile as a bubble, and he didn't want her spraining an ankle. Smooth move, Duke, but Ariam found it a bit odd. She didn't sign up for a Duke and a half. They reached a park, and Duke transformed into a casual stroller, pointing at flowers and whatever caught his fancy. Unexpectedly, a guy named Damir rushed in, all apologies and drama. Turns out, he owned the rival jewelry shop and they nabbed the saw-stealing scoundrel. Duke, instead of unleashing a wrathful storm, just calmly listened to Damir's plea for a contract renewal. To Ariam's surprise, Duke spared Damir and walked away, leaving the poor guy in shock. Ariam, in her confusion, wondered if Duke's leniency was some kind of strange consideration for her. The emotional roller coaster hit her, and before you know it, tears were doing the cha-cha down her cheeks. Duke, seeing the waterworks, got concerned. Little did he know, Ariam was having a moment of realization. She'd successfully turned the mighty Duke into a character from a tearjerker soap opera. The next morning marked the grand finale of Ariam's dance preparation. And guess who decided to join the dance floor? None other than the Duke himself. To Ariam's surprise, the Duke had some moves. Turns out, he wasn't just good at ruling a kingdom, but he could cha-cha like a champ. After a bit of twirling and spinning, they headed to the Duke's office. In his majestic office, the Duke handed Ariam the task of playing the letter ninja again. But, amidst the cutting and snipping, the Duke couldn't help but wonder why Ariam seemed as slender as a stick. His frustration bubbled up. He just wanted her to be happy, and her changed attitude had him scratching his head. 
driven by his desperate desire to see Ariam smile, the Duke abruptly stood up and left the office. He wanted her to be as hearty as a laugh track on a sitcom, not as frail as a dandelion in the wind. Later, Ariam received a letter from the prince, it was an apology letter, and the prince wanted to meet her after the birthday gala to propose something shiny and new. Duke, not thrilled about the prince's sudden interest, declared he'd handle the situation personally. At the gala, Duke and Ariam hit the dance floor. They were twirling like they were auditioning for a ballroom dancing reality show. But, just as things were getting interesting, someone interrupted the Duke. While Duke was away, Ariam decided to sip on some wine like a sophisticated lady. However, the elegance was short-lived as she started coughing and vomiting blood. The whole place collectively gasped, talk about stealing the spotlight at the party. In a whirlwind of drama, Duke swooped in like a superhero and caught Ariam as she dramatically pointed at the waiter, blaming him for the poisonous drink. Duke, not one for subtlety, charged at the waiter like a rhino on a mission, delivering a royal beatdown and calling in the cavalry to arrest the miscreant. Escorted to a room, Ariam looked like she had one HP left, dangerously low on the life bar. Duke had a light bulb moment. He did a wrist slicing maneuver and started rubbing his blood and Ariam's together like some bizarre potion making ritual. Lo and behold, it worked. Ariam regained consciousness, probably questioning Duke's first aid techniques. Duke reassured Ariam that justice would be served to the poison peddling scoundrel and ordered her to take a royal nap. Meanwhile, Duke stormed outside, where fate had a little meet cute planned with none other than the prince himself. Already simmering with anger, Duke unleashed a tirade on the prince, demanding an explanation for the letter shenanigans. The prince, playing the I'm the innocent one card, claimed it was just an apology. Duke, not buying it, punched a vase nearby, probably a priceless antique. After a heated exchange of words, Duke left the scene, leaving the prince in a state of confusion. Back at the Hall of the Poison Punch, the prince, having a eureka moment, realized that Duke refrained from turning the waiter into a royal pancake because Ariam was around. Duke scooped Ariam up in his arms and whisked her away to the carriage. Nestled in the cozy confines, she decided to have a heart-to-heart -heart with Duke. With a serious expression on her face, she informed him that in case she kicked the bucket, he should handle her unpaid paycheck. Duke, wide-eyed, looked as though he had just spotted Bigfoot. Relief washed over him when Ariam forgave him for whatever shenanigans went down on their first day at the palace. Upon reaching the palace, Duke tucked Ariam into her bed, playing the role of the perfect caretaker. The next morning, Ariam woke up a tad bewildered to find Duke chilling by her bedside. He confessed he was worried she might have pulled a sleeping beauty, which made Ariam feel like royalty. Duke, with genuine concern, explained it was akin to his childhood fear of his mom snoozing permanently. Cut to the chase, Duke spilled the beans to Ariam about the halfway point of blood transfer. Furious, he confronted Pope about why her blood wasn't purified entirely. The conversation escalated into a heated debate about black blood, light, and all things vampire. Ariam, caught in the crossfire, sat there utterly confused. Duke, not one for subtlety, yelled at her, demanding if she was aware that vampire blood coursed through her veins. Pope, grinning like a Cheshire cat, locked eyes with Ariam. With a mischievous twinkle in her eye, Ariam revealed to Duke, sharing a secret only the two of them were privy to. She spun a tale for Duke about getting smacked by a carriage, and Pope chimed in with the revelation that her body was a bit of an empty vessel. According to Pope, people could be categorized as either dark or light, but Ariam defied such labels. She was like an empty soda can, fizz-free. Duke connected the dots, understanding why her hair was as dark as a moonless night, and her blood had a taste that could put garlic-flavored toothpaste to shame. Pope, realizing he's become expendable, was politely shown the door by Duke, who probably needed some space for his brooding. With Pope out of the picture, Duke, in a moment of bossy concern, commanded Ariam to take a horizontal position on the bed. However, Ariam thought it wasn't quite fitting for a Duke to be playing nursemaid. Duke, showing a soft side, insisted he enjoyed their unique dynamic and wanted to take care of her. He even threw in the offer to go back to the way things were in the past, to which Ariam, swift as a ninja, shot up from her bed, making it clear she had no interest in that retro nonsense. The next day, Duke embarked on a mission to unmask the villain behind Ariam's carriage encounter. The waiter spilled the beans, it was none other than Ian Franager. In a powwow with Logan, Duke decided they'd relocate right after the birthday gala. Meanwhile, Ariam, casually reading the newspaper, nearly choked on her coffee when she stumbled upon paparazzi headlines about her and Duke being the hottest gossip in town. Pope, like a persistent salesperson, tried to convince Duke to postpone his return to the estate until the advent. 
Duke, not buying what Pope was selling, shut him down, suspecting Pope's sudden concern had more to do with the fear of being shunned than anything else. Ariam, with a diplomatic touch, assured Duke it was okay if it was about him. That night, in a move that could be misconstrued, Duke summoned Ariam to his room. However, it was not a steamy rendezvous but a delivery, a page revealing that Ian Franager had been caught with a forbidden book and was due for a date with the Emperor and the Council. Ariam, overjoyed at Duke's revenge plot, mentally high-fived him. The following day, Duke and Ariam set off for the estate, and upon arrival, Duke, with the grandeur of a royal pronouncement, assigned Ariam the prestigious role of official document sender and receiver. In Duke's fancy office, they handed Ariam the I quit paper from her old job, and then the royal estate guy spilled the beans about her new gig. Surprise, surprise, it was like comparing apples to spaceships. Duke casually mentioned she could start her new adventure tomorrow. The royal estate escort walked Ariam to her new digs, practically doing a victory dance because Duke finally swooped in. Apparently, work had piled up like a tower of pancakes, and Mr. Fancy Pants was struggling to keep it from toppling over. He showcased the office maze and the library, and at this point, Ariam's brain felt like it was doing acrobatics. Then, the grand tour hit the jackpot, the room. Ariam walked in and was hit with a blast from Grandma's Dreamland. Mr. Fancy Pants assured her it wasn't over the top, but Ariam was like, am I in a palace or an art museum? He advised her to chill and even promised a maid to rescue her from the pre-banquet chaos. As Mr. Fancy Pants waltzed away, Ariam entered her room, feeling like she landed in the coziest cloud ever. A bath was ready, but Ariam, not quite used to royal pampering, felt a tad out of place. The maid transformed her from regular human to royalty with a salon session fit for a queen. Deep down, though, Ariam knew this fairy tale could turn into a pumpkin carriage any second. Duke's moods were as predictable as a cat on a hot tin roof. As the night rolled in, the royal estate party kicked off, and Ariam was all dolled up like a princess. A royal with a femboy flair named Ashel came over, flashing a charming smile and trying to win her over. Duke, feeling a sudden surge of jealousy, warned A.S.H.E.L. to keep his distance. Looks like someone woke up on the grumpy side of the royal bed. Ariam sat next to Duke as he grabbed the mic to announce his grand return. The royal table looked like a wine lover's paradise, and Ariam, being twenty, thought, why not? Sip, sip, it tasted like victory. But Duke, being the responsible adult in the room, shut that down real quick, forgetting that in vampire years, she was still in the sippy cup phase. Ashel, ever the conversation ninja, slid in with some random talk about, let's just say, personal preferences. Duke, not having any of it, brushed him off. Meanwhile, Ariam, in her grape juice-induced haze, got a bit tipsy. Duke's attempts to play the sober coach failed miserably. He finally gave up and decided to play the role of the babysitter. Carrying a giggly and chatty Ariam, Duke escorted her to her room. She was blabbering about who knows what, probably the secrets of the universe or her favorite snack. Duke, like a pro, tucked her into bed. In her tipsy state, Ariam got a bit emotional and asked Duke what she'd accomplished during their time together. Duke told her she changed him and his whole royal routine. Ariam drifted off into dreamland with a smile on her face, leaving Duke to contemplate life choices. The next morning, Ariam woke up with her blanket looking like a skyscraper at sunrise. Ariam woke up with a big all smile on her face because Duke dropped the bomb last night that she's super special to him. In the library, Duke turned into a vampire chemist, cooking up a secret recipe to turn Ariam into a bloodsucker like him. Duke, but he wasn't exactly planning to ask Ariam for permission. He figured he'd just turn her into a vampire first and then spend eternity begging for forgiveness. Talk about playing the long game. Duke, the master chef of vampire conversion, started spicing up Ariam's meals with a dash of his own blood. Ariam, clueless about the behind-the-scenes drama, went off to her office. The estate royal handed her the thrilling task of copying a ledger. Exciting stuff. After slaving away on her thrilling ledger mission, Ariam headed back to her room feeling a bit down because she hadn't laid eyes on Duke all day. Meanwhile, Duke was in vampire lab mode. A maid swooped in and announced dinner time, guiding Ariam to a fancy room with a glass window. Lo and behold, Duke was there, looking paler than a ghost. Ariam figured Duke might need a refill of that red stuff soon. The idea of Duke sipping on someone else's blood made Ariam feel a mix of queasy and jealous. So, being the smooth talker she is, she asked if they could make this dinner for two thing a regular deal. Duke, with his pale but polite face, agreed to the proposal. As the day rolled on at the fancy royal estate, the helper guy noticed that Ariam was no slouch in the brains department. He even went so far as to claim he was the mastermind behind her newfound skills, throwing shade at the advisor who used to be in charge. In between sharing his get-rich-quick schemes and dissing the economy, 
He brought up the whole Duke liking Ariam situation. Ariam felt uncomfortable and shut that down real quick during dinner with Duke. She thanked her lucky stars for having such a stellar team, including the Duke and the royal smarty pants. But, oh snap, Ariam forgot to call Duke her superior during the dinner chat. Quick save. She threw in a compliment about how Duke outshone even the royal smarty pants. Duke tried to act all cool but you could practically see him blushing under the royal chandeliers. The next day, Ariam got a mysterious package from a tran, and the royal smarty pants revealed that it was from a swanky place called Balatinan. He went on about flowers and beauty while Ariam searched for Duke to deliver the goods. Unfortunately, Duke was Mia, so the smarty pants suggested leaving him a note. Ariam jotted down a message, but the smarty pants got a chuckle, thinking it sounded a bit too steamy. Meanwhile, in another corner of the story, Millard was counting down the days, holding a mysterious black potion like he's waiting for a cosmic sale. Back in the library, Ariam was scratching her head, wondering why Duke agreed to all those emperor terms way back when. Advisors tried to clear things up when, boom, Duke walked in, asking about that steamy note. Off they went to retrieve the mysterious package, and with Duke strolling beside her, Ariam turned into a blushing mess. Love is in the air, or maybe it's just the royal perfume. Blushing like a tomato, Duke popped the big question to Ariam, asking about that mysterious note. But, oh boy, Ariam went all secret agent on him and replied with a classic it's nothing. Smooth move, Ariam. Then, the plot thickened when Duke handed her a super top secret package. Drumroll, please. Turns out, it was just a brochure from a summer clothing store. Duke, being all mysterious Sigma male, told her to pick out her summer wardrobe but made it clear she's footing the bill. Sugar daddy alert. Or not, the clothes in the brochure were practically on a clearance sale. Ariam, wide-eyed, probably thought Duke was being overly generous. But, oh no, Duke got it all wrong, thinking she found the prices too high. Ready for the superhero move, Duke declared he'd make the store drop their prices even more. Ariam had to be the voice of reason, telling him it's already cool. Then came dinner, fashionably late, and Ariam couldn't help but wonder why they were having an eBay dinner party after everyone else had ghosted the dining room. In between bites, she dropped the bomb. When are my fab clothes arriving? Duke's jealousy radar going off. Duke asked, who's the lucky person she's dressing up for? Ariam, cool as a cucumber, shut that down, saying it's all for her own fabulous self. Post-meal, the server slid over some mysterious pills. Duke revealed they were the ultimate poison protection pills. Ariam, skeptical but game, gulped them down and, with a twinkle in her eye, dropped the let's go on a picnic to Balatin and Bomb. Duke, a bit bummed because he wanted to be the picnic planner, reluctantly agreed. Bright and early, Isabel transformed Ariam into a picnic-ready queen. While brushing her hair, little Ariam's tummy rumbled, and she wanted a snack. But, Isabel wasn't having any of it, fearing Ariam might end up looking like Big Show from WWE. Apparently, ladies don't chow down, or so Isabel claimed. Ariam was shocked, did she just get called a lady? All dolled up, Ariam sashayed into the hall, and there stood Duke, looking like he just discovered a secret treasure. The carriage ride to the picnic spot was like a nerdy first date, with awkward compliments flying left and right. Balatinan, the picnic destination, turned out to be a field of dreams, covered in gorgeous flowers. Also, a bunch of servants and maids were on the picnic. Duke and Ariam strutted through the flowery wonderland. But Ariam, the Sherlock Holmes of the picnic, noticed the local factories were on a smoke break. When she questioned Duke, he casually brushed it off, claiming they must be on vacation. Vacation. More like picnic mode, activated. Picnic time. They dove into the feast they brought, and Ariam quickly realized why Isabel had been the snack police earlier. Ariam excused herself to whip up a flower ring for Duke in the fields. She slid it on his finger, and voila. Duke was over the moon. In the end, it turned out to be a wholesome picnic or as we like to call it, a date with a side of flowers. Back at the estate, Ariam discovered some letters that smelled like a flower shop on steroids. She turned into Sherlock Holmes and confronted the estate royal about the fragrance mystery. Dodging the question like a pro, he ninja dashed away, leaving Ariam with more questions than answers. She handed him the letters, but he casually tossed them into the basket, setting off Ariam's curiosity alarm. With a magnifying glass in hand, Ariam peeked into the basket and, surprise, found a love letter from someone named Rasana to Duke. She got jealous seeing that. The letters from Rasana kept flooding in, and so did Ariam's jealousy. At dinner, she looked rough and worried, probably due to the mystery love notes. Duke noticed and asked, but Ariam, pulling a classic move, claimed she was just tired. Yeah, right. Later that night, Duke had a heart-to-heart -heart with the estate royal, dropping the why is Ariam so sad. 
Bomb, the estate royal revealed, Ariam had spotted those Rasana letters. Duke told the estate royal to spill the beans and let Ariam read the drama-filled letters. Next day, the estate royal played Cupid and granted Ariam permission to dive into the love letter saga. She sprinted, opened the letter, and oh boy, it was like reading a text version of a Playboy magazine. Jealousy level, over 9,000. That evening, Ariam pulled the I'm sick card to skip dinner with Duke. Little did she know, Duke was worried sick about her. He played detective, caught her red-handed strolling the hallway, and, without saying a word, knew she was avoiding him. The next day, Duke decided to dive into the Rasana drama and read the letters himself. But surprise, surprise, he didn't tell the estate royal. The estate royal, sensing Duke's cluelessness, had to play detective and informed him that Ariam was feeling blue because of a classic case of jealousy. Duke, being Duke, assumed it was just a one-sided crush from his end. Meanwhile, Ariam was stuck in a love letter tornado, unable to focus on anything. Her mind was on Duke, Duke, and more Duke. It's like love on steroids, but with fewer heart emojis. Just when Ariam thought the love letter saga couldn't get crazier, a servant waltzed in with more letters. And bam, Millard's response letter to Rasana was in the mix. Ariam's jaw probably dropped to the floor. During a study session with the advisor, Ariam hit him with the ultimate philosophical question, does God exist? The poor advisor, usually the wise one, stumbled and fumbled like a stand-up comedian facing a tough crowd. Fast forward to dinner that night, and Duke revealed it to Ariam. He took charge and told her he handled the Rasana situation by sending her a rejection letter. Turns out, some random human who barely knows Duke wrote a love letter, and Duke was not having it. Then, Ariam dropped a bomb of her own. She asked Duke about Saul, the supposed god of their world. Duke, the bearer of truths, shattered her hopes by revealing Saul was just a metaphorical light, not a wish-granting deity. Ouch. The next morning, in the midst of Isabel making Ariam fabulous, Ariam sought advice on confessing love. Isabel, the love guru, dished out some wisdom, and Ariam took notes. At dinner, Duke was fashionably late, so Ariam decided to play detective herself. Off to Duke's room she went, probably ready for a love letter showdown or maybe just to raid his snack stash. Ariam caught Duke red-faced because he was fashionably late, but not for a trendy reason. He was busy crafting paper cranes for her. It turns out, Duke was caught in the act of self-play, blushing like a tomato. Quickly recovering, he suggested they hit the dinner scene. At the dining table, Ariam tried to play it cool, pretending the paper crane incident never happened. Duke apologized for the delay, clearly embarrassed. Ariam, being the curious soul, asked if Duke had a wish since he was folding those origami birds. Duke revealed confessing he thought Saul wouldn't grant Ariam's wishes, so he was hoping the cranes could work some magic. Ariam, emotionally overwhelmed, dropped her fork upon hearing this heartfelt revelation. Grateful, she thanked Duke, who, being a humble soul, insisted he was just trying, not waving a magic wand. Now, Ariam had a burning desire to confess her feelings but lacked the guts. Taking inspiration from Rasana, Ariam decided to write Duke a love letter. However, tension hit her like a ton of bricks, and she couldn't come up with a single word. It took her an entire night to compile a letter. In a bold move, she handed it over to the royal estate, gave copies to the maid and advisor, and ordered a letter delivery extravaganza to Duke. Fast forward a few hours, and as Ariam was returning to her office, Duke came rushing in like a rom-com hero embracing her tightly. Turns out, he got the letter, a declaration of Ariam's love in written form. So, there they were, wrapped up in a tight hug, and Duke spilled the love beans. He promised Ariam that he'd be her knight in shining armor, ready to protect her from any drama life throws at them. Suddenly, he whisked her away to his office, declaring it the war room for planning their future. Inside the office, Duke suggested they ditch work and head to the desert or beach for some chill time. But hold your horses. Ariam, being the independent adult she is, wanted to earn her own cash. Duke reluctantly agreed to let Ariam keep her work mojo. But fear not, he shifted gears and started plotting their wedding. Ariam, feeling like a deer in headlights, thought she was too young for that whole marriage thing. The next day, Duke showed up at Ariam's office, and the air got thick with romance. They were all touchy-touchy, doing the whole lovey-dovey dance. But guess who crashed the party? The estate royal, barging in like a drama queen. She scolded Duke for not keeping his lovey-dovey moments in check during work hours. Undeterred, Duke pulled the same stunt during Ariam's study session. Ariam, getting all serious, told him she enjoyed his company but had things on her to-do list. She feared drowning in love would make her useless. Duke, realizing he overstepped, backed off and left. Back in his room, Duke, feeling like a love-struck teenager, worried about being too pushy. 
He popped some sleeping pills, hoping not to disturb Ariam during her work. Ariam woke him up, apologized for the yelling episode, and they had a cute romantic moment. Over breakfast, Duke, attempting to be charming, asked Ariam out on a boat date. Smooth moves, Duke, smooth moves. So, Ariam agreed to Duke's boat date plan and the maids went into overdrive packing up a bunch of bags. Ariam, looking at the mountain of luggage, raised an eyebrow and questioned the maids. They spun a tale about the store owner wanting to win her over with gifts, but Ariam smelled something fishy. On the big trip day, Ariam was dolled up and ready to roll, leaving Duke in total awe. They hopped into the carriage, cruising toward their boating adventure. During the ride, Ariam decided to school Duke in the finger-counting game but he was basically the losing champion. So, she came up with a fun punishment, a little wrist tap for the loser. Duke wasn't a fan, proposing an I love you confession instead. Smooth move, Duke, avoiding the wrist taps. Finally, they reached the boating spot, and as they floated along, Ariam popped the question. What if they ended up in the water? Duke, with his knight in shining armor vibes, reassured her that he'd be her rescue ranger. Back at the estate, the gossip mill was churning about Duke and Ariam. Some folks were cheering for them, while others were waving the no-go flag. Drama alert at the estate. After a fun day of boating, Duke and Ariam landed at the Basil family's place, where the hosts were in a room dilemma. The Basils wondered if Duke and Ariam should bunk together or get separate sleeping spaces. At dinner, just as Ariam was about to dig in, Duke, the ultimate food taster, checked her meal for any sneaky poison. The homeowner suggested winter sledging at the lake, leaving Ariam puzzled because apparently, she'd been living under a rock. Duke, catching wind of her curiosity, asked the homeowner to drop him a letter when the lake turned into a giant ice rink. After dinner, the ladies brainstormed about Ariam and Duke's night setup. Isabel, taking charge of Ariam's makeover, spilled the beans that they'd be roommates for the night. Ariam, at a sprightly twenty, got a tad worried about the whole sleeping arrangements. No one's trying to catch a case here. As Isabel pampered Ariam and sorted out her hair, she dropped the bomb about the shared room plan. Nervous but compliant, Ariam was led to the room where Duke was already playing possum. When she entered, he pulled a fake sleep stunt. Ariam planted a goodnight kiss, and just when she thought the drama was over, Duke pulled off a surprise I'm awake move and returned the favor with a smooch. Classic Duke. After Duke's surprise smooch, Ariam was like, whoa, hold your horses, buddy. Duke, realizing he'd jumped the gun, sprinted out of the room in embarrassment. He decided to crash in another room for the night, probably thinking he needed a timeout. The next day, Ariam gave Duke the cold shoulder. Poor guy was fretting big time. Ariam and Isabel were hanging out in the garden, and Isabel, being the peacemaker, asked if the two lovebirds had a spat. Ariam just chuckled it off, but Isabel knew better and begged her to patch things up with Duke. As they left the garden, Duke finally mustered the courage to say sorry, but guess what? Ariam had already pulled a vanishing act. Later, on the carriage ride back to their estate, Duke spilled the apologies, admitting he acted like a total goofball. He even called himself a pervert and a beast. Talk about self-roasting. Ariam, playing it cool, brushed it off and casually asked about his beauty sleep. Then, out of the blue, she threw in a request for a cheek kiss. Duke, being the quick kiss ninja, went in and out. But Ariam pulled him in for a full-on lip lock. Turns out, Ariam had a nightmare about being locked up and needed some serious comfort. Duke, probably still processing the situation, got a first-hand taste of Ariam's dream-induced kissing demand. Life's full of surprises, huh? Back at the estate, late at night, Duke was in his office, going through his stash of mysterious black liquid. The stuff he'd been giving Ariam. Now, Ariam, poor thing, was basically experiencing Duke's childhood nightmares in her dreams. And trust me, it wasn't a walk in the park. Duke knew that turning Ariam into a vampire was a one-way street. No U-turns allowed. But Ariam, being the smart cookie she is, had her suspicions. She sensed the vampire makeover plan but decided to play it cool, waiting for Duke to spill the immortal beans. Meanwhile, Ariam was juggling pros and cons like a circus performer. Duke, a socially awkward vampire maker, didn't exactly shine in the boyfriend department. Yet, she decided to cut him some slack, giving him a final shot at redemption. If he messed up, she had a vampire card ready to play, Eternal Silence. In the midst of her contemplation, Duke barged into her room. Ariam, with a raised eyebrow, fired questions about her impending vampire status. Then, she pulled out the big guns, channeling her inner drama queen. She demanded more of Duke's mysterious black liquid, playing the girlfriend on her period card. You know, the classic move. So, Duke figured out that Ariam caught wind of his whole vampire-making scheme. He chickened out from coming clean and did a confused lap around the estate. Poor guy was sweating bullets, worrying if Ariam would go all hulk on him. 
After some internal pep talk, Duke mustered the courage to face the moody Ariam again. She was standing there, giving him the stink eye. He mumbled a sorry, but Ariam wasn't having it. She demanded the classic move, get on your knees, mister. So, there's Duke, on his knees, spilling his feelings. He spilled that he didn't want her to kick the bucket and was desperate to make her happy. Before knowing about her sacred, he was just a guy worried about his girl's mortality. He spilled about humans being fragile and having short lives. Like, was that a personal attack? Anyway, Duke went on about loving her, not wanting her to croak, and deciding darkness infusion was the cure. He was willing to go to extremes to keep her, blinded by the hope of eternal togetherness. Ariam softened up, probably realizing Duke wasn't just brewing trouble. She hugged him, dropping the wisdom bomb that he should never pull a stunt like that without her consent. Duke, grateful for the mercy, promised to consult her on major life decisions from now on. Then, Duke, ever the smooth talker, pitched the vampire life as the VIP pass to safety in their dangerous world. Ariam argued that life's beauty lies in its expiration date. Duke, persistent as a fly at a picnic, insisted on eternity together. Ariam decided she won't join the vampire club, and instead, she asked Duke about his biggest worry with her staying human. Duke revealed that he feared vengeful humans might target her to get back at him. Then Duke proposed to marry her when she's rocking granny vibes. He declared that wrinkles and all don't bother him. He just wanted that granny pizzas. Talk about commitment. Duke swore to smash any humans who dared mess with Ariam before she hit the big 100. Ariam, touched by the pledge, hugged him and told him to bring on the revenge if needed. Duke promised to unleash chaos if anything happened. Now, Duke believed Pope could cure Ariam, but warned her it might sting a bit. Later that night, Pope arrived, but he was a bit puzzled by the dark vibes in the air. When he realized what Duke had done to Ariam, he unleashed a big brother level of scolding, probably louder than when someone messes with his PS5 controller. After the verbal storm, Duke assured Ariam that Pope would work his magic to save her. The next morning, Duke transformed Ariam into a fashion-forward vampire repellent superhero with a cape and escorted her to a church where Pope was ready for action. Ariam kneeled, and Pope began his purification routine. However, things took a dark turn when Pope's thumb touched Ariam's forehead, and blood started oozing out. She took an unexpected nap, unconscious style. Ariam woke up all snug in her bed, sunshine beaming through. She noticed the sunlight didn't feel like a BBQ on her skin anymore, so she asked Duke if the cure worked. But guess what? Duke, playing the silent game, didn't spill the beans. Furious Ariam inquired about Pope's whereabouts. Duke revealed that Pope would be fashionably late because he overdid his magical energy tricks. Ariam, feeling like Rip Van Winkle, asked how long she was out. Duke revealed that it was a whopping three days. Now that's what you call beauty sleep. Then, Duke, the drama king, started shaking like a leaf. He spilled his guts, confessing he thought Ariam was on her way to the great beyond. He blamed himself for all the blood and tears, thinking he'd turned into a professional sin-committing machine. As Duke was having his moment of moron, Pope made his grand entrance. Ariam, grateful for the rescue, thanked him for the life-saving gig. She couldn't help but Pope the question about the purification process. Pope, being the wizard with the answers, declared it done and dusted. Ariam officially joined the Soltera Club. Now, Duke, in full simp mode, begged Ariam to stick around for the grand finale. So, Ariam dropped a truth bomb on Duke, telling him she's loving the human life in their world. Being human meant caring and taking risks, and Duke, being her knight in shining armor, was doing just that, taking care of her and facing the risk of losing her. The next day was a royal family shindig, and they all gathered around the table for lunch. But Ariam and Duke pulled a Romeo and Juliet, sitting on opposite ends. The other royals, being the gossip squad they are, bombarded Ariam with questions about the juicy rumors. Ariam, playing it cool, claimed there were so many rumors she had a hard time keeping track. As the royal gossip session heated up, a servant with a bottle of wine approached Ariam. Duke initially said no, but Ariam, in her happy-to-meet-the-relatives vibe, begged for just one glass. Duke reluctantly agreed, oh, the things we do for love. Later, they strolled through flower fields, and Ariam, thanks to that wine, was as tipsy as a cat on a hot tin roof. In her merry state, she popped the big question, would Duke protect her and stick by her side? Duke, being the smooth operator, brushed it off like a pro. But little did Ariam know, Duke had a surprise up his sleeve. As they sauntered along, Ariam spotted a fancy dome ahead. It hit her like a ton of bricks, Duke was about to pull a proposal stunt. Lo and behold, Duke went all out, proposing in a romantically epic way, sliding a ring on Ariam's finger, and sealing the deal with a kiss. The news spread faster than a squirrel on roller skates, and folks were buzzing with excitement about the upcoming royal wedding. 
In the cozy palace, the Duke and Ariam were enjoying their time together. Rumor has it they even engaged in a bit of friendly wrestling the night before. The Duke, however, received an invitation that seemed to be missing an important detail. While snuggled up next to Ariam, the Duke couldn't resist his peculiar fetish of hair sniffing. He was having a grand old time playing with Ariam's locks. The next day, they set out to find a suitable match for the Duke's flora. But, oh dear, Ariam wasn't too thrilled about the whole matchmaking business. She boldly asked why the Duke wasn't considering using her blood for Flora's needs. Instead of giving a straight answer, the Duke suggested they sleep in separate beds for a few days. Ariam was fuming, but she reluctantly agreed. As they reached their destination, the Duke looked as pale as a vampire on a night shift. Ariam, being nearly immortal with her strong muscle mommy vibes, assured him she could handle anything. Duke, however, insisted on accompanying Ariam. In the midst of their library adventure, he suddenly passed out. When he woke up in bed feeling like a deflated balloon, he was not in the mood for sipping on other ladies' blood. Just as he pondered his life choices, a beautiful lady waltzed in, claiming the king was worried and had sent her for Flora. Things took an unexpected turn as the lady decided to play a round of royal twister on top of the duke. The situation got pretty intense, and just when things were heating up, in walked Ariam at the most awkward moment possible. Witnessing the scene, she swiftly turned around, dagger in hand, ready to tackle the royal drama. So, the duke, feeling like a shaky leaf in a windstorm, shuffled over to Ariam. Now, you'd expect Ariam to be all fired up or annoyed, right? Surprise, surprise. She went in for the hug, telling the duke to chillax and recharge his batteries on the bed. Then this other lady, the blood messenger for Flora, barged in. Ariam, quick thinker that she is, suggested, Hey, how about you either cut your arm or let the duke take a little nibble on your neck for the royal juice. Before Ariam could make her great escape, the duke grabbed her hand like it was the last slice of pizza at a party. Ariam assured him she was tougher than a cookie dunked in hot coffee. Trying to slip away, she found herself caught in the duke's grip. He gave the blood messenger the boot, and then he was dragging Ariam back to his royal resting spot. Dagger alert. The duke snatched it away, giving her the stink eye about bringing a pointy thing to the party. Why'd you bring this dagger, Ariam? He asked. She revealed, saying she was ready to slice and dice for a blood offering. Duke, puzzled like a cat trying to figure out a laser pointer, thought she didn't like that idea. Ariam hit him with the real talk, asking if his bod and heart belonged to her. The duke, probably imagining a big property of Ariam's stamp on his chest, nodded. She then revealed if that's the case, he should skip the buffet and sip on her blood smoothie. The duke was a bit worried, like a kid thinking broccoli might be gross, but Ariam was all in. He took a little nip from her neck, and bam. It was like the best dessert he ever had. Tears started flowing like he just watched a puppy video. Next day they were on their way to Grenoble, a place with a fancy farm belt, claiming their juices were fit for an emperor. But trouble struck, and they had to make an unexpected pit stop in Manford City for the night. Duke wasn't throwing a party in his head about it. Turns out, he had some not-so-sweet memories of Manford because they were all about that vampire life. Ariam, being the curious cat she is, asked why nobody did something about these vampire enthusiasts. Duke told her there was zero evidence, and the court would think everyone was just spinning fairy tales. He popped the big question, scared, much, and sealed it with a smooch. Smooth, Duke, real smooth. He promised to be Ariam's human shield, even if they camped out at the Manford castle. Now, Ariam, with her imagination running wild, thought, wait, is Duke a vampire? She figured Manford people might be dangerous for her, being a mere mortal. They finally reached the Manford Palace and got a royal welcome from the owner, who ushered them in like VIPs. Inside, Ariam spotted a girl with blue hair named Julia. No fear of black-haired wonders here. At the dinner table, Ariam eyed the tea suspiciously, thinking, is this some Scooby-Doo mystery? But the house lady gulped it down like it was a smoothie, so Ariam figured it was safe, no poison today. Then, tea time turned into story time as the house lady asked about the story behind Ariam's ring. The lady revealed, or revealed about the ring, revealing some magical lettering appearing in the stone when light hit it. Duke bailed on the candlelight ring test, claiming he was too tired for the light show. Ariam and the house lady were left to spill the tea. The house lady, with all the subtlety of a detective in a mystery novel, started asking Ariam about her marriage plans. She dug deep, wanting to know if Ariam got any pearls of wisdom on tying the knot. Then, she went full Sherlock Holmes and inquired about Ariam's parents' will. Ariam, in her cool and collected style, mentioned she had a bunch of folks back home who showered her with advice whenever she needed it. 
She also poured her heart out, confessing her deep love for Duke and how sure she was that her parents would give their blessings if they met him. Now, here comes the plot twist. The house lady was acting fishier than a penguin in a fruit market. She called in a servant, demanding the finest hot coffee, and then dropped the bomb. She asked Ariam to send away her posse, the bodyguard and handmaid, for a little tea to teat. Alone at last, she straight up asked Ariam if she really wanted to sign up for the vampire wife gig. Ariam was like, say what now? The lady painted a pretty grim picture, talking about enduring marriage for eternity and serving up blood cocktails to Duke forever. To drive her point home, she showed Ariam a scar on her own hand, like a creepy vampire membership card. The lady wrapped it up with a horror movie speech about the terrifying life of marrying a vampire, then made a dramatic exit. Fast forward to Ariam finding Duke in a room, nose buried in a book. She was all shades of blue, and Duke, being the attentive partner, noticed the sadness. He pops the question, and Ariam spills the beans about the house lady's warning against the vampire wedding. Duke, after hearing about that, got so riled up that he stormed out with Ariam's dagger in hand. Drama queen much. But Ariam, the peacekeeper, stepped in like a boss before Duke could unleash some dagger dance moves. Concerned, Duke grilled Ariam about her decision, and she reassured him with the ultimate promise. She'd never take off his ring. Smooth move, Ariam. But then, Duke, playing detective, asked what exactly the lady spilled. Ariam revealed, the lady warned her that marrying a vampire would be a wild ride, and she should run for the hills. In a cozy hug session, Ariam, probably trying to calm Duke's inner vampire, dropped an old school story bomb, Romeo and Juliet. Ah, the Og star-crossed lovers. Duke, eager for the moral of the story, got hit with the if people try to keep lovebirds apart, their love only gets stronger wisdom. Duke, loving the plot twist, thought everything was okay and leaned in for the kiss. Ariam pulled back, claiming she wasn't done. She threw a curveball about the scar on the lady from Manford and asked if her hubby was a vampire. Ariam, with her detective hat on, got a bit freaked out, imagining cult activities and blood-sucking rituals. Ariam vouched for the Manford lady, thinking she was a genuine helper, not a cult queen. She laid down the law, making Duke promise not to spill the vampire beans to the Manford lady. Duke, probably realizing he's in deep, agreed. The next day, at the grand function, people couldn't help but admire Ariam's fabulous hair. All eyes were on Ariam as people couldn't help but glance at her fabulous hair. She felt the attention and decided to join in the hair talk. Ariam casually mentioned that both her parents had black hair and then fired back with the questions. The lady in the hot seat blushed and revealed about inheriting her hair from dear old dad. Enter Duke. He waltzed in and, without missing a beat, offered to put asphalt on the lady's hair if she was feeling jealous. Ariam, being the girl power advocate, grabbed Duke's hand and shut down the potential hair crisis, declaring it a girl talk zone. As the guests kept streaming in, Duke and Ariam got separated. Duke, contemplating whether to retreat to his room, got intercepted by the Manford man. The man revealed about his wife being rude to Ariam. Duke, in his cool Duke style, waved it off, claiming Ariam didn't mind. The Manford man was low-key shocked that Ariam was so chill about it. But the Manford man had a secret mission and escorted Duke to a so-called safe place. Duke, raising an eyebrow, followed him, thinking it might be a hidden snack haven. Instead, they ended up in a dungeon with a massive metal door. Duke, losing his patience, demanded the man tells him what he was up to. But nope, the man was all about suspense. He claimed the real safe place was a bit farther, leading Duke to a devil church with a throne fit for a vampire king. The man spilled about their need for a place to share faith and encouragement. Duke shut that down real quick. Instead, he asked the man to tell the real tea about Ariam. And oh boy, it got intense. The man spilled that while Ariam might be a looker with good manners, all she really wanted was the power promised by some mysterious edict. The Manford man went all storyteller and claimed that Ariam revealed to his wife. According to him, Ariam spilled the Duke tea, saying she's marrying him because he's a rich, handsome hunk who showers her with love. Classic gold digger accusations, right? Duke stood up from his throne and decided to make a grand exit. But the Manford man played his trump card, trying to guilt trip Duke by hinting that Ariam might just be in it for the money. Apparently, he didn't want their vampire god falling into the clutches of a supposed gold digger. Hearing this, Duke had had enough. He gave the man a smile that probably screamed, nice try, buddy, and made it clear that he'd never change his mind about Ariam. Exit stage left. Meanwhile, back in Ariam's world, she was on a mission. Worried about Duke's disappearance, she decided to put her detective skills to use. She asked Isabel for some tongs because, you know, every good detective needs tools. She had a plan to heat the ring and check if it held any secrets, like Manford Man claimed. 
Just as she was about to turn her plan into action and put the ring over a candle flame, Isabel showed up. Ariam told Isabel she needed a bit of privacy, and off Isabel went. Ariam heated the ring, only to find a hidden vow of their partnership. Duke appeared out of the blue, casually mentioning that he had already told this before. As Ariam put the ring back on, it felt a tad heavier. Duke, in a surprising burst of sweetness, tossed a blanket over Ariam, fearing she'd catch a cold from her detective escapades. With the cozy blanket setting the mood, he couldn't help but ask Ariam about the alleged rich and handsome compliments she apparently showered on him to Lady Manford. Duke dropped the bomb on Ariam, revealing what Lady Manford said about her supposedly talking about him to her. Ariam went into full panic mode, worried that Duke might think she's some gossiping chatterbox. Ariam frantically clarified that she was just chatting with Lady Manford about her parents and how, if the man was rich and handsome, they would happily accept him. Duke, being the cool cucumber he is, calmed her down and suggested she hit the hay. In a surprise move, Duke scooped up Ariam and carried her to bed. As they lay there, Ariam went on a full explanation spree, assuring Duke that she loved him for who he was on the inside, not just his wealth and royal status. Duke apologized for causing a ruckus and assured her he didn't mind even if she had married him for his fancy perks. Then came the mushy moment. Duke hugged her tight and dropped the bomb that he'd make her empress if she wanted. Ariam hit him with a hypothetical, what if she started loving him for his riches and then he lost it all? Duke basically said, let's not cry over spilled wealth, just go with the flow. Morning rolled in, and surprise, surprise, heavy rain outside. Ariam, eager to escape Manford, felt a bit down. Duke broke the news that they'd be stuck there for another night. Logan popped in with a bunch of documents, and Duke decided to put in some work, taking the day off. Ariam, bored out of her mind, tried reading but to no avail. She suggested to Duke that she'd visit the birdhouse. Duke told her to take a guard with her. As Ariam ventured outside, she bumped into the Manford lady in the hallway. Small talk ensued, with Ariam mentioning she was off to the greenhouse. The Manford lady, with a sudden interest in horticulture, asked if she could tag along. Ariam and the Manford lady, sitting in the greenhouse like they're on some kind of awkward plant-themed date. The Manford lady, probably trying to be polite after her previous rudeness, asked Ariam about her day. Ariam wasn't exactly thrilled to be hanging out with her, but hey, safety in numbers, right? The Manford lady, doing her best apology routine, said sorry for being a bit rude the other day. She revealed about stuff going on at home, and Ariam, being the understanding soul, shared that it even reached Duke. But it seems the message got a bit tangled along the way. Ariam reassured her it was all good, even if Millard was giving her the stink eye. After a little chat, they decided to explore the flower wonderland around the greenhouse. Ariam, stumbling upon some gorgeous white flowers, was in awe. But the Manford lady pulled the classic I've got chores to do excuse, holding a pair of scissors like she's on a mission. Left to her own devices, Ariam got teamed up with the green-haired girl, Julia who showed her the bird scene. Ariam, feeling like a bird whisperer, started feeding them. Just when things were getting chirpy, the green-haired girl pulled a plot twist. She tried to take Ariam down. Ariam's guard swooped in like a boss, blocking the attack, and yelled at Ariam to make a run for it. Ariam, with a painful cut on her hand, ran like her life depended on it, which, let's be real, it kinda did. The guard lady, showing off her dagger-throwing skills, tossed one to Ariam like they're playing some wild game of catch. But the Manford lady popped up like she's part of the action movie cast. Ariam accused the Manford lady of being in on the whole let's take down Ariam plan. She warned her to keep a safe distance and made a grand exit from the greenhouse, throwing the dagger for good measure. As Ariam sprinted, pondering the craziness, Duke, with his superhero senses, sniffed out her blood trail. He raced towards her, scooped her up, and dashed back to the palace faster. Back at the palace, Isabel, always ready for a crisis, went into nurse mode. Duke licked Ariam's wound until it magically closed up. Forget band-aids, it's all about vampire saliva. Ariam, probably exhausted from the wild run and vampire healing session, took a quick nap. When she woke up, she found Duke by her side, looking like he just binge-watched a thousand sad movies. Isabel, bringing the news, mentioned that the guard lady wanted to see Duke. But Ariam, not feeling the socializing vibe, said she wanted Duke to stick around. So, Duke pulled the bed curtains like he's creating a VIP lounge for Ariam. So, Duke, in his I'm the boss mode, summoned the guard lady and called in the dynamic duo, Manford Man and Lady. The guard lady revealed, the assassin chose a shortcut to the afterlife, leaving everyone puzzled. 
but they nabbed the Manford duo for this circus. Manford Man, unleashing his inner drama queen, screamed about the Emperor's wrath and how they'll pay for this. Logan, scolded the guard lady for kickstarting this whole mess. In the middle of this shouting fest, Duke walked in. Silence fell like a royal decree, everyone shut up. Duke, probably channeling his inner volcano, looked ready to erupt. He marched up to Manford Man, who started pleading innocence. Duke decided to give Manford Man a taste of his own medicine. He grabbed the broken arm and gave it a royal squeeze, causing Manford Man to cry like a baby. But Duke wasn't done, he added a dash of artistic flair by slashing Manford Man's face. Voila, now he looked like a potato carved by a five-year-old. Just when Duke was about to turn this into a face-painting party, Logan, the peacekeeper, intervened. He reminded Duke that, as much as face potato Manford Man deserved it, they needed info first. Duke, reluctantly putting away his art supplies, shifted gears to the serious business, the royal interrogation. Manford Man, in full-on drama mode, bawled his eyes out, claiming he knew nothing about the assassin maid. Classic deflect and blame move, he threw his wife under the royal chariot, insisting she handled all the hiring drama. But the Manford lady wasn't about to take the fall. She, too, played the blame game and pointed fingers at the head maid, claiming she recommended Julia without knowing she was an undercover assassin. Duke decided to end this royal blame fest and called in Logan, the fixer-upper. Orders were given to Logan to escort Pope to the basement storage room and throw the Manford duo into royal timeout. Duke strutted away. The next morning, Ariam woke up feeling surprisingly spry. Isabel, with her soup game on point, brought a bowl to Ariam. But why soup for just a tiny cut on the arm? Confusion set in, suddenly apologizing for not acing the protection gig. Ariam checked if the guard lady's hands were still in tip-top shape. Good news, they were. Night fell, and Ariam, yet again, got a soup delivery from Isabel. Just as she was sipping on her mystery soup, in walked Duke, sporting a bathrobe like he just conquered a royal mud wrestling match. Tired and probably in need of a spa day, Duke rejected Ariam's chef offer, claiming she needed to preserve her energy. Ariam, sensing Duke's bad mood, pulled the classic I'll go brush my teeth excuse, because good oral hygiene is a royal priority. When she returned, Duke was still in the same gloomy position. Ariam, being the caring empress, asked the big question, what's eating you? Duke apologized, swearing he'd protect Ariam from any harm. Ariam saying revenge was like his royal duty or something. Duke revealed that he messed up their faces and limbs and threw them into temple prison. But Ariam, not a fan of watching people turn crispy, suggested they make a swift exit at sunrise. However, the next morning, Pope delivered the news of central investigators and fact-finders descending upon Manford. Surprise, surprise, they had to extend their stay in this drama-filled town. Ariam, probably thinking she's in a never-ending royal soap opera, revealed to the investigators. Just when she thought they could finally escape, more troubles knocked on their royal door, forcing them to stick around a tad longer. In the midst of all this, as Duke toiled away in the office, Ariam strolled in with a genius plan. She suggested they shake things up with the religious fanatics who believed Duke was their vampire god. Her master plan convinced them Duke wasn't the real deal, and maybe they'd lose interest. Duke, torn between wanting to protect Ariam's peace of mind and appreciating her genius, agreed to discuss it with Logan. Ariam, puzzled by Duke's conflicting emotions, was left in confusion. Ariam, in full-on cheer-up mode, crafted Duke a flower crown, but he was as excited as a zombie at a disco. Ariam decided to drown her sorrows in some liqueur. Things took a wild turn. Ariam, embracing her inner party queen, drank herself into a state of regal queasiness. Duke arrived and escorted her to bed. Trying to be supportive he asked if she wanted to pack a few bottles for the road. Considering her newfound love for the spirits, Ariam unleashed her frustration. She questioned Duke about the prolonged pit stop and why he left her in the dark. Duke told her that they were doing preparations for the perilous path to Baragogni took time because of bandits. Ariam, now on the warpath, sat up and gave Duke a piece of her tipsy mind. She expressed her need for attention. And Duke, realizing he messed up, revealed his vampire feelings. He wanted to ensure her safety, hence the delay. Ariam grabbed Duke's hand and reassured him she could handle it. Duke, feeling like a romantic hero in training, asked Ariam how he could make her happy. Ariam, seizing the moment, declared her dream to be the most beautiful bride in the kingdom. Duke promised her the grandest wedding ever. Where does Pope came from? Pope, whose real name was Ezra Travis. From the day he popped into this world, he was a bit peculiar. He couldn't walk straight, and to make things interesting, he saw people for what they really were on the inside. No fake masks for Pope, he saw through all of that. 
One day, his mom dragged him to meet the intimidating Duke. Now, Duke was as dark as a black hole, and Pope got the heebie-jeebies just being near him. From that moment on, Pope prayed like there was no tomorrow, begging the universe not to let him cross paths with the Duke again. Fast forward to the present, where the Duke, Ariam, and Pope find themselves in a bit of a pickle. Duke was paranoid about security, Ariam was being all mysterious like a cat, and Pope was blabbering about the Duke snubbing the Emperor's invites. Apparently, attending once was considered a fluke, talk about harsh critics. Pope convinced Duke that attending the Emperor's shindig was crucial for his noble street cred. He threw in the responsibility card, telling Duke that the higher up you are, the more important it is to show up at these imperial parties. Duke worried about Arian's well-being, asked her if she wanted to go, but she wasn't keen because Duke didn't like it. Then Pope stepped in, explaining to Arian the whole nobility responsibility jazz. He mentioned Duke's heroic deeds like eliminating bandits and slavery, and Arian was practically applauding in amazement. Pope sweetened the deal, promising Duke a little bonus if he tagged along. Pope went to the emperor, spun some yarn about Duke agreeing to attend, and dropped the bomb that it was all because of Ariam. The emperor was over the moon, and the pope was pretty pleased with himself. But, as Pope helped everyone fulfill their wishes, there was no one around to grant his wish for a personal stand-up comedy show. Life's unfair, isn't it? So, the next day, Pope swung by Duke's crib, and there he bumped into Ariam, who was all smiles because Pope had a knack for saving her life. Pope casually asked Ariam about their New Year's prep. Ariam revealed, saying everything was going swell. Duke, though swamped with work, still managed to join her for horse riding practice. Pope dropped the bomb that Duke would be rocking the besting crown. Ariam figured out it was the blessing procession before they hit the road. But Pope, despite being Mr. Popular, claimed he wasn't qualified for the procession blessing gig. Turns out, his fellow popes weren't popping bottles for him. They dissed the idea, thinking he only got the nod because he was cozying up to a high and mighty vampire. Pope revealed to Ariam, who, being the supportive friend, assured him he was the right man for the job. They giggled and cracked jokes, making the room sound like a comedy club. Little did they know, Duke heard their laughter from the hallway. He waltzed in, telling Ariam their giggles were audible miles away. Then, the interrogation began. Pope revealed that he was just there to scope out the festival preps. Pope asked Duke if he was scheming something fishy, like making him the blessing procession poster boy. Duke threw it back at Pope, saying it's his call. Pope, not one to back down, threw the ultimate question at Duke, why the obsession with power? Ariam, sensing the tension, made a run for it and found refuge with the Guardian. As Pope observed Duke and Ariam's dynamic, he couldn't help but think they were like the quirky family next door. Fast forward to the ceremony, and Pope was decked out like the bell of the ball for the blessing procession. The town was buzzing with festival vibes, drums banging, trumpets blaring, the whole shebang. Pope, standing on the terrace looked like a holy man descended straight from the sky. Suddenly the emperor and empress entered the scene, making a grand entrance that would put a Hollywood red carpet to shame. But the Pope, with Ariam's pep talk echoing in his head, flashed a smile and kicked off the procession blessing ceremony. As he chanted his magical spell, glitter rained down from the sky like a sparkly blizzard. People were mind blown. The divine power show, though, left Pope feeling a bit like a deflated balloon. As Pope strolled back into the palace, a guard praised him for the glitter extravaganza. Little did Pope know, Duke was brewing a storm of annoyance about the whole glittery situation. Fast forward to the night, Pope followed a servant on a secret mission. Why? Because he got a letter from Duke saying Ariam had caught a cold and needed him a SAP. The sneaky adventure led Pope to a candlelit wonderland where Ariam and Duke were chilling. The Pope questioned Ariam about the letter. She apologized, praising his festival skills, but Duke was on a glitter vendetta, annoyed that sparkles and lights invaded his personal space. Ariam revealed that they actually summoned the Pope for a lantern launch party. She handed him a lantern, and Pope, probably thinking it was a new festival trend, gladly took it. They launched the lantern into the sky, but Pope, being the clueless hero, couldn't figure out why they dragged him into this lantern affair. After the lantern show, Ariam turned into a hugging machine, embracing Duke and gushing about how happy and amazed she was. She even cracked a joke about hiring a cheering squad next year, because why not make your own fan club, right? But the Pope, standing there like the third wheel at a joyous party, wasn't feeling the excitement. Nope, he was hit with a wave of jealousy, wondering how a guy with a darkness-filled soul and a girl with an empty inside could team up and find happiness. He felt like the odd one out, clueless about what would bring him joy. As Duke and Ariam strolled away, Pope played the role of the solo spectator. Duke asked the Pope to join the party. Off they went to a feast fit for kings with turkey and cake galore. 
Pope, in total confusion, questioned this strange gathering. Priam revealed, saying it was banquet time. Pope, still puzzled, asked if they were serious about throwing a banquet at such a late hour. But Ariam and Duke, acting all mysterious, didn't told about why they really wanted the Pope there. Ariam, sipping her drink like she was in a detective movie, decided it was time to thank Pope for being her personal superhero. She threw in a prayer for his wishes to come true. Pope turned to Duke for answers. Pope, still scratching his head, asked if Duke put his name in the hat for the high priest gig. He couldn't wrap his brain around why they needed a temple connection. Duke revealed they needed a high priest because the temple and palace were apparently on a mission to eliminate him. Pope argued there was no reason for people to want him six feet under. Ariam spilled that they just wanted someone close to have a fancy position in the temple. She teased Pope with a big secret only the high priest knew, but sorry, no spoilers for him. Duke said all Pope had to do was decide if he wanted the job or not. Now, in Pope's room, he kneeled in front of a statue, contemplating life choices. So, fast forward three years into the Duke and Ariam marriage saga, it's their anniversary day. The locals, though thinking the empire got a bit shinier with Duke tying the knot, still saw the power couple as the kings and queens of self-centeredness. In the palace, Duke wasn't just calm, he was on cloud nine, thanking his lucky stars for snagging Ariam. Why? Because he was now immune to the fear of losing her. Duke decided to make a grand entrance into the library, where Ariam was deep into her studies. She threw some expedition and demon island gossip at him, but Duke had other plans. Ignoring her chit-chat, he scooped her up for a romantic kiss. Hold on, though. Ariam, being the sensible one, halted the lovey-dovey action, claiming hallways weren't the place for such shenanigans. But there wasn't a soul around, so they went for it, a hallway smooch session. Duke revealed about the demon island, explaining it got its spooky name because it was inhabited by folks with brown skin, and they were kinder rare in the empire. Now, Ariam casually dropped that people with brown skin were a dime a dozen where she came from. But, Ariam, getting all serious, pointed out the empire's lack of a port. Duke, the master of dodging serious talks, ignored her concerns and slipped into his playful and mischievous mode. The next day, Pope was doing a happy dance because Ariam revealed the second plan. But Pope was stuck in a mental pickle. He wanted that warm and fuzzy feeling he got with Duke and Ariam, thinking that becoming a high priest might be the golden ticket. Meanwhile, in Dreamland, Duke was having a dark and twisty nightmare about Ariam's grand entrance to the palace. Waking up, he expected to find her by his bedside and he was met with a face-to-face -face stare. Duke worried that Ariam, hailing from the demon island, might just pack her bags and leave him. Quick thinker that he was, he planned to woo her with island gifts and maybe even her parents, if they were up for it. The next day when a chatty traveler showed up at the palace, revealed his journey. He yapped about getting hurt, encountering folks with black hair and dark skin, and a morning ritual called Obelish. Ariam grilled the traveler about the island's god, Gudillo. Duke started suspecting that Ariam might have some demon island connections. As Duke and Ariam rolled in a carriage to who knows where, Duke popped the question. He asked if Ariam's hometown was the infamous island. She shut that idea down, claiming she never even heard of their god. Duke, relentless in his investigation, asked if she missed her hometown. Ariam revealed that she did and even missed her parents. He revealed to Ariam about his not-so-happy childhood, revealing he had no hometown to call his own. Then, in true nosy fashion, Duke popped the question that he wanted to know every juicy detail about Ariam's life. She revealed, spilling it all. Fast forward to noon in the palace, and Duke's mind was like a blender, processing all the info Ariam dropped about her hometown. Night bulbs turning darkness into day. Weird tech stuff for him. But Duke, being the skeptic, couldn't decide if it was a wild story or pure truth. And then came the mystery of Ariam's hometown location. She played dodgeball with that question. Duke called up Pope for the 411 on Ariam's origins. But, Pope couldn't recall the deets, claiming it happened way back when. So, Duke, desperate for info, prodded Pope about his thoughts on Demon Island people. Pope dropped the bomb that no matter how Demon Island folks looked, they sure weren't empty vessels like Ariam. According to him, Ariam's got this soulless vibe, moving around like a puppet with only memories to guide her. Now, Duke, lying next to snoozing Ariam, couldn't shake off the worry about a potential third world existence. He knew there were light and dark worlds and, apparently, a world where Ariam came from. The big fear, Ariam might want to dash back to that world if the doors swung both ways. As insomnia and anxiety became Duke's new BFFs, he spotted a dark raven on his window. 
The next day, Duke was in full-on worry mode, fearing Ariam might just up and leave. To keep her by his side, he pulled the classic move of stopping her from going to a friend's birthday bash. Like a master chess player, Duke suggested they take their vows. Ariam, caught off guard, expected Duke to wait until she hit the ripe old age of 80. Duke, with anxiety levels skyrocketing, sat Ariam down for a serious talk while holding on to her like a teddy bear. He straight up asked the big question, was Ariam from another world? Ariam, the dodgeball champion, chuckled and swerved the question like a pro. Duke pressed on, wondering why she was dodging this topic. Ariam, with her fake smile game strong, spilled the beans. She explained that if she spilled the truth about getting teleported to their world by getting hit by a car, it would sound like a plot from a cheesy novel. With a grin as wide as the Grand Canyon, she assured Duke he knew all her secrets. Duke, overjoyed, probably did a happy dance in his mind. They shared a romantic moment, sealing the deal on their little secret sharing session. So, a couple of years flew by, and now Duke and Ariam have a little dude named Wyjin, who just hit the big one minus two. At a fancy dinner with the Duke's fam, Wyjin's got questions. He's wondering why they're munching on breakfast while other royals are still in dreamland. Ariam, being the wise mom, throws in a curveball and asks Wyjin if he's found a girl to hang out with. Now, Wyjin ain't into the whole dating scene. Duke senses this and assures Ariam that Wyjin will find his way eventually. But Wyjin's not having it. He storms off the table, probably contemplating the struggles of being the Duke's offspring. People talking smack, giving him the stink eye, not a fun time. Up in his room, Wyjin's deep in thought, hating the idea of going out just to please the masses. He knew some girl would come along but he was already predicting the gossip behind his back. And then, enter Juan, ACIL Travis's kid, barging into Wyjin's sanctuary, begging him to go out and play. Juan, played the annoying big brother card, won't take no for an answer. At the festival, Wyjin was majorly stressed about what people thought of him. Every laugh felt like a personal attack, poor guy. But then, out of the blue, a girl waltzed up, asking about his festival partner. Wyjin spilled the beans, he was partnerless because he didn't have the guts to ask anyone. Now, another boy swooped in, yelling at the girl that she agreed to be his partner instead. The girl, with a swish of her imaginary cape, shut him down like a pro, promising they could team up next year. Off she went to smooth things over with the boy, leaving Wyjin in a whirlwind of social anxiety. After that he and the girl both teamed up for the acorn gathering competition. As they hunted for acorns, they spilled the beans about their lives, and Wyjin found himself feeling pretty good about his new partner. But the same boy from earlier came. He started trash-talking about Wyjin's mom and dad, poking fun at the whole vampire-human mix. Enough was enough. Wyjin, channeling his inner superhero, gave that boy a heavy punch. Wyjin and the boy duked it out, with Wyjin somehow landing on top. But the Duke got the bat signal and swooped in. Instead of going all Hulk mode, Duke calmly sniffed out the situation, scooped up Wyjin, and whisked him away. Inside the palace, Mama Duke went into full-on worried mode when she saw Wyjin's battle scars. They called the Pope, but it wasn't the legendary Ezra this time. Nope, a new Pope was on the scene. Now, the boy's parents got the royal summons, and Duke, in all his wisdom, demanded a proper explanation. Ariam grilled the boys for the deets. Wyjin, sensing the impending doom, couldn't muster the courage to spill the truth, so he pulled the classic move. Tears and it's all my fault routine. Ariam, playing the good cop, asked for an apology. But the girl who teamed up with Wyjin waltzed in, spilled the beans, and Ariam started scolding both boys like a boss. Apologies were exchanged, and crisis averted. As the boys' parents made their exit, Ariam whispered something mysterious in the mother's ear, leaving her trembling. Ariam praised Wyjin for his bravery, claiming she would have thrown a hundred punches if she were in his shoes. But Duke, ready to unleash his fury, got stopped by Ariam, who reminded him that he already warned the family. In a heartwarming moment, Ariam hugged Wyjin, thanking him for defending their honor. Wyjin realized he hit the parent jackpot with these awesome folks who guide him through problems, even the tricky ones he can't figure out on his own. Ah, the adventures of royal family drama and healing hugs. Make sure to subscribe and leave a like to help the channel out. Thanks for watching.